And uh, when, when Jochen told me uh, that the topic was insecure for today, I actually got really excited just because it's a topic that's uh, quite near and dear to my heart. Um, th this past year, I went through like a huge year of personal growth and transformation. And at the start of the year, I, I think I was just like such an insecure person, always tearing myself down, comparing myself to other people, you know, focusing on what I didn't have instead of what I did have and not loving myself properly. Right. And I think that's something that we all do. And those are things that we all go through from time to time. <clears throat> and I just got to this point where feeling this way all the time, it was leading to like really bad habits and these, these toxic cycles and things. And I, I was just like, you know what, like, this is all bullshit. Like I want to find a way to feel worthy, to feel beautiful, to feel loved without anybody else having to tell me that, you know, I'm, I'm beautiful or that they love me or that I'm worthy. And at the end of the chapter of this year, I, I wrote this song, actually, it's called Validate. And it, it talks a little bit about that, just really learning to feel beautiful uh, without anybody else telling you that you are. Here we go. <laughs> Start your morning off with your coffee on my balcony, cigarette in your hand, making it easy. Then you tell me that I look good in my robe, don't know where to go, don't know what to say. Have you ever been treated this way before? And you crawl underneath my skin and make me question every feeling I have within. Yeah, yeah. So just say something to make me feel beautiful. Cause I feel so unsuitable for you. It's been about a week. Since I've been trying to feel this way Is this the usual for me? It never takes too long Just give me the things that I read by young To make it better These bad habits make it better But won't it for so long? So don't say something To make me feel beautiful Cause I wanna feel that way without the help of somebody else And this night's feeling less than what I deserve And you're sitting on the couch with your white t-shirt Like you're my preacher, just validate me I gotta retrace my steps to where life made me believe I'm not a note, I'm not whole, that there's something wrong with me. And you crawl underneath my skin and make me question every feeling I have within. Yeah, yeah. So just say something to make me feel beautiful. Cause I feel so unsuitable. It's been about a week since I've been trying to prove to you This isn't like usual for me It never takes too long Just give me the things that I rely on To make it better These bad habits make it better But won't it for so long So don't say something to make me feel beautiful Because I want to feel that way without the help of somebody else Without somebody else Cause there ain't nobody else Without somebody else <laughs> Thank you.
Hi, I'm Stephanie, and uh, I've got a wind machine, aka a fan, behind me, so I'm not trying to look like Beyonce in a music video. Uh, it's just a really hot day in the Netherlands today. Um, so I'm going to speak about insecurity and leadership. I know very little about leadership, but I know a lot about insecurity. It's just to um, quickly introduce myself. I'm a communications manager at Kraft Heinz. Um, storytelling has always been my passion and using stories to connect with people and create a shift in mindset or behavior. When I was seven years old, um, my parents were once called into school by my teachers because I was selling stories to my classmates for a dollar each. And for an extra dollar, I was writing them as heroes in their own stories. Uh, I wish I had the confidence and the balls of that seven-year-old kid again. Um, I graduated from university before I turned 21, so I was pretty young when I started working and pretty young when I became a manager. So by the time I was 25, um, I was managing people and campaigns for global brands in an agency. Uh, I wanted to just continue working solo and creating stories on my own. Um, but as most of you in marketing and advertising will know, storytelling is a team effort. And there comes a point in your career when you have to take the lead um, and take charge, whether you like it or not. For me, it was daunting and it made me feel insecure because I, I thought I wasn't ready. And I think it didn't help because I was constantly told by my boss and uh, some of my colleagues I was too nice to lead. And I think that really undermined my confidence. Um, the first time I had to take charge in a room with a client, uh, their entire marketing team, their ad agency, their digital and their events agencies, I was terrified. Um, I wanted to demonstrate that I do have leadership qualities. So what did I do in that meeting with like 40 people in a big war room? I tried speaking with a louder voice, a deeper voice. I smiled less. I tried to be more brash and more forceful. I, I modeled myself on what I thought a good leader was, even though I just felt like an imposter. You know, fake it till you make it. Um, Needless to say, it was a really bad meeting. Um, I it, think it took me a while before I was able to sit myself down and ask myself some tough questions and reflect. You know, does being nice get in the way of me doing my job? Am I able to, for instance, give feedback honestly and critically? Uh, do I agree with things in meetings just to not ruffle any feathers? You know, because sometimes I can be a people pleaser but um, you don't want to be a doormat at work. So once I established that my niceness wasn't making me less effective at my job, then that's when I started challenging my own assumptions about leadership and, and trying to construct a new mental model. So when you think about a good leader, you know, what qualities come to mind? I think most people would say, confidence, you know, maybe strength, maybe even a little bit of aggression. So many terrible leaders fit that bill. I, I won't name any names here. Um, I'm not saying confidence isn't a sign of a good leader, but it's only addressing the symptom and not the root cause. Is the confidence coming from, from true competence or just arrogance, you know? And I think sometimes it's really hard to tell. I think we all have an unconscious bias that we aren't even aware of. And when we start to question why there aren't enough women in leadership positions, maybe the question we should really be asking ourselves is what we think leadership looks like. And it's not just like a woman versus men thing. I've seen, I've seen a study showing that men who are more agreeable, you know, the nice guys, also tend to be rated as less competent. So I thought to myself, what I really need is more imagination when it comes to leadership. What does a great leader look like? And our media always shows us the usual suspects because they're so charismatic. You know, we say things like, well, he's a dick, but that's why his company is so successful. And we don't pause to consider um, and say things like, imagine how his company could be even better if he wasn't a dick. And, you know, I'm glad that leaders like 
uh, Jacinda Ardern, who's the Prime Minister of New Zealand, or taking the spotlight these days. Uh, Jacinda steered her country so well through some of the worst crises ever, like COVID-19 and the terrorist attack in Christchurch a couple years back. And she, she talks in interviews about how you can be both compassionate and strong at the same time. Um, that there's this tendency for people to underestimate her because she's a kind person. Then there's the former um, CEO of Lego. I know there are some Danish people in the house uh, who could probably help me pronounce his name because it's hard to get right. Jürgen Vid Knudstorp uh, or something like that. Well, he took the helm when Lego was basically a sinking ship and he turned things around and you don't hear his name a lot, but you know, it's, um, he's interesting. You should really Google the guy, read more about him. Uh, but apparently he was a very nice guy who would personally answer letters from children and parents. And there's so many more I can name. Um, that's why I started seeking out mentors and role models who lead with kindness and compassion, whether it's just people I read about in the media, like, you know, the names I mentioned just now, or real life people that I knew and I worked with. And, you know, I learned you don't always have to seem like you have it all together. Um, insecurity is good. It means you're not a sociopath, um, but showing your weakness as well, because you're just, you know, building trust and credibility with your team and the people that you have relationships with. And finally, I, I learned how to embrace what was perceived as a vulnerability and a weakness. It was a really uncomfortable process at first because it seemed like I only had two options right in the beginning. I could have either buried my insecurity by pretending I'm something I'm not, or I accept it as a weakness, which I think would have limited my ambitions in life. But I found this other way of working through it. And you know, the last two companies where I worked were startups with a bit of a tech bro culture, but I, I'm proud that I stay true to myself. Um, that I speak up for myself and there are still days when I doubt myself but I think more than ever you know we need some kindness and empathy and compassion in the world today and I don't feel ashamed to bring that into the workplace anymore um, I think at the end of the day I rewrote myself as a hero and a leader in my own story and what is supposedly my kryptonite is also my superpower and it's your story to write at the end of the day. So thank you. So I, I don't know if there's a special way because I, I guess you have to explore it in the best way you know how. So first, like what I said about my own experience was really confronting it head on um, to see is it valid? Is this person's feedback valid? Is this a weakness that I have to work on? Or is this just a perception issue? And I think in a lot of cases, you know, um, the criticism about my niceness was a perception issue. It didn't really impact my performance or, you know, how effective I, I was at my job. Um, so I think if it's a perception thing, it seems a lot more shallow and superficial. So then, you know, I think it gives you a little bit more confidence um, to, to deal with it and, and speak up for yourself and be strong. <laughs> I don't think there was any way that it would have went well. Um, I, I, I think, you know, uh, people see through immediately if you're not being authentic. Um, so I think if I hadn't learned from that, I would have still continued, you know, faking it, thinking that I could fake my way to success. Um, but you know, you, you read, I'm sure some of you have read articles about the imposter syndrome, where even if people get into, uh, very, you know, successful jobs or positions, they still feel somehow like they're a fraud. Um, and I think a lot of it also comes down to authenticity at the end of the day, whether what you're doing really reflects what you feel inside. Today, I want to talk to you about security actually as a means of connection and of creating community. Um, I feel like insecurities get a really bad rap. 
we see them as these fallacies and these like deep character flaws that we need to work on. We need to get rid of them. We need to love them out of our systems completely and let them go. Um, I disagree with that like deeply. Um, as humans, I feel like we have this incessant obsession with security. We need to feel secure about ourselves, our jobs, our every single choice in life. We need to be secure all the time. But at the end of the day, I think we all find that that isn't realistic. Um, two years ago, I found myself in a pretty weird phase in my life. After studying law for years, I decided that a legal career was actually not for me. So I quit law school. I started working full time to save my money to go on an extended trip I'd been dreaming of for a long time. And on that trip, I told myself that I was going to figure out what I was going to do. If not law, then what? What was my big plan for future security in my life? I didn't really know what I was gonna do with that. All I knew was that I wanted something that would be more aligned with my creative interests. So as preparation for that, I started attending creative events here in Amsterdam. And I had this hope that they would guide me somewhere, that they would show me, you know, a little bit more of what it is that I should be doing rather than what I shouldn't. Um, and the events were incredibly ins inspiring as we see now as well but I couldn't help but feeling like I didn't fit in. I felt like somehow my lack of any formal creative experience or education made me a fraud. And I created this very intense internal judgment zone for myself. And then I made actually two connections at Creative Mornings um, where I had two conversations in which I just said, you know what, sometimes I have no idea what I'm doing. And at this moment, especially, I have no idea where I'm going to go. And they said that they felt the same way sometimes. And for the first moment, I thought, oh, so I do deserve to be here. I'm not the only person in this room that feels that way. And it was really reassuring. So for the first time, I guess, in a long time, I felt the rumblings of something that was headed in the right direction. And I wasn't sure what it was or what it would turn into, but it was something. So I noticed that in the months after that, I kind of unknowingly applied that same communication to my personal life, where I remember later that summer, a friend took a photo of me that I was deeply insecure about. It was about a part of my body. And I shared it. And instead of coming up with some cool, quippy caption, I just shared, hey, this is a photo I'm really insecure about. And I got DMs from people. And we had these private, always private, but very meaningful conversations. So I kind of continued to apply that as I prepared for my travels and as I went through my travels and even now that I've returned. And the connections just kept coming. And it's those connections for me that have turned this concept of insecurity on its head, where rather than seeing insecurity as just this negative thing I used to see it as, I can see that it has positive potential as well. Um, today, two years later, I feel like we're definitely in a space where we're seeing the importance of that open communication and conversation. We see that conversation is creating connections, and it's also healing collective traumas. Um, so I think there's no better time to start practicing that speaking up and to talk about our insecurities and maybe not even about them, but in spite of them. Um, I feel that in talking about the things that make us insecure, the things that really scare us, we create those connections and we create that healing for ourselves, but also for others. So I'm not saying you need to reveal your deepest, darkest secrets, but what about the smaller things? What about the things that scare you, that hold you back, that are actionable? Like maybe your fear is going to a yoga class, but you're afraid of being the only one in the room. How about talking about it? Maybe your fear is bigger. It's something about your, what you're missing in your job or in your relationship. Well, guess what? You're not the only one. 
I have those too. Everyone here has those too. And maybe if we talk about them, we can take away a lot of that power that they hold over us. When I was considering applying for this talk, I'll leave you with one little, uh, last little anecdote. I actually almost didn't apply. Um, I had this little grubby note in my room for weeks. It says apply to Creative Mornings. And I almost didn't do it because I felt that I didn't deserve to be in the room. And here we are. So think about that. Think about what being, me being here today means for me, but think about what it can mean for you as well. What are the things that you deserve to do that you're holding yourself back from? Um, in my video pitch to Creative Mornings, I surprised myself with a little tidbit. I said, insecurities are only connectors if we speak them out, if we give them the space to breathe and exist, if we talk about them, and breathe air into their lungs, our insecurities can breed gifts. And I really, really believe that that's true. So my request is pretty simple. I want us all to leave here today and think about these insecurities in our lives that we're tying this shame to, and think about how we can get rid of some of that shame. Shame doesn't grow you, it doesn't help you. So let that go. And then think about who you can talk to about your insecurities through what medium, and see what gifts it brings. I, for one, am always here. So, you know, DM me. Let's have these conversations. Let's talk about it. It starts with one initial spark of courage. And after that, believe me, it will flow. Definitely. I think that vulnerability is the starting point for most every meaningful connection. I I'm a big proponent of being vulnerable and I recognize that there are certain limits. Like I said, there's deep dark secrets that you're not ready to share or that you don't need to share. But I think that sharing the things that are a little more, yeah, shareable that you do feel vulnerable about, vulnerable about uh, can give you a lot in return. So insecurity and vulnerability for me are definitely interlinked um, and valuable. Yeah, I think that that's a great question. It's something that I, uh, I definitely, so I don't think that sharing your insecurities will solve every problem, right? There are certain basic things in life that we need and work is, is one of them. Um, so will sharing necessarily put money in your bank account so that you do have housing? No, but I do think that even in a situation like that, even if you're in this really difficult situation that you don't know how to get out of, I find that if you share about that, you will find people who are willing to at least help. And it can be difficult. It can also be very insecure and very vulnerable to receive help. Receiving help is, is hard. But if you open yourself up to the sharing, but also the receiving, I think that it can help in that way, definitely. That, yeah, that's a tough one as well. I've definitely found myself in situations where I see that this is not a, a space for it. Um, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to gut feeling. I think that you know when it is safe. You will know based on the people that you're interacting with, whether these are the people that you should be talking to. So I would say just always, always follow your gut. That's the best way to go about it. Hi everyone, I'm Sadie Demarivas and I am a creative strategist from Chicago who specializes in branding and communication strategy. Um, I'm also a new member of Creative Mornings Amsterdam community, so I'm really excited and grateful to be with here, be here with you guys today sharing my three-step guide to mastering insecurity. To kick us off, we're going to do an insecurity check, and that is so each of us can gauge what we're feeling insecure about lately. And I know it's early, some of you maybe don't have makeup on or maybe your hair is not done, maybe you're following the new trend of not putting on pants, but if you haven't already, please put on your camera. Um, I promise we're only gonna see your hands really. Uh, and we, I'd love for us all to do this together. So I'll give you guys a second if you haven't turned on your camera already. Okay, 
Um, to do our insecurity check, we're gonna put both of our hands in front of our camera like so, and we're gonna do a version of the TikToks, put a finger down check challenge. Um, I'm gonna name a bunch of things very quickly. And if you felt insecure about the thing that I'm naming in the last six months, I want you to just put a finger down like so for everything you felt insecure about. All right, ready? Here we go. Put a finger down if you felt insecure about something you created. Put a finger down if you felt insecure about speaking another language. Put a finger down if you felt insecure about having to pitch or share your work. Put a finger down if you felt insecure about having to pitch or share your work over video conference. Put a finger down if you felt insecure about whether you'd be hired for a job or a project. Put a finger down if you felt insecure about a romantic relationship. Put a finger down if you felt insecure about your body or your appearance. Put a finger down if you felt insecure more specifically about needing a haircut. Put a finger down if you felt insecure about your ability to finish everything you need to in time. Put a finger down if you felt insecure about the way you shake hands. Really good news. We don't have to do that last one anymore, so. Um, thank you guys. That was our insecurity check. Great job. A round of applause for being brave enough to admit your insecurities in public and to turn on your camera so early in the morning. Um, I want to make a clear distinction. The guy I'm about to share with you is to address fear of inadequacy or inferiority or internalized insecurities. Um, these are insecurities brought on by negative self-talk. Things like, I don't know what I'm doing or I haven't accomplished enough. My pitch will never win. Um, it's not a fix for very real external insecurities like the one Ron asked about earlier. So things like food insecurity, systemic racism, sexism, all of which also can lead to heightened sense of internalized insecurity. Yes, these are um, externally provoked insecurities and they require collective action or help from others rather than individual mastery. So not for that. By now you might be asking, why am I here? What qualifies me of all people to be talking to you guys about internalized insecurity today? Um, well, I recently became something of an expert, uh, at least in feeling it. For almost seven years, I produced and occasionally wrote and creative directed content before I focused in on creative last year. Some might have called me a workaholic on a good day. <laughs> I had quickly risen through the ranks of my 100 person agency taken on a fourth of its biggest account. I worked weekends. I traveled every month for client events. I worked through holidays. My job was like my top priority. Say what you will about that. But um, just as I was about to make this big career leap to my agency's creative team, something I'd been working for for three years at that point, my partner got a job offer in the Netherlands where he's originally from. So needless to say, I felt like I was sacrificing this huge piece of my identity to come here. Um, and it took a lot of convincing on his part, but once I was in, I was in, and if there's any producers in the audience, my rusty producer muscles just immediately took, took over, timelines were drafted, budgets made, and then boom, an impossible to predict global pandemic. Uh, the goodbye parties were canceled, timelines moved up, and producers' worst nightmare. In some cases, they were completely scrapped. <laughs> And what's worse is I wouldn't be able to meet people in the way I was used to and to make the profound connections face to face. Um, in short, it was a recipe for insecurity. And being a strategist, I realized I needed to develop a way to deal with these feelings. And I dove into some things, read my heart out, and I developed a three-step guide, which I'll share with you now. So step number one, stop giving a shit. Not in like an angsty teenage wasteland, Kurt Cobain, nothing really matters kind of way. Uh, we don't news like we don't like those guys. Honestly, this came up earlier. It's the sense of the fact that they're not expressing that insecurity. We hang out with them, maybe we go drinking, but and we talk about the death of art at the hands of consumerism or whatever. Um, but they're not the people you're running to when you're feeling the most insecure. What I mean by stop giving a shit is maybe you're feeling insecure about an upcoming pitch or sharing your work. Maybe you're feeling insecure about the fact that you're not working for the brands you had hoped to at this point. Uh, the same way we did in our insecurity check, just make a mental note of that insecurity and when you're feeling it most strongly. Is it when you're hitting send on a project? Is it when you're talking to a particular friend or colleague that seems more successful to, than you? Take a note of those moments 
of insecurity, identify them, and decide if they're what Arthur Brooks, the Atlantic's How to Build a Life column editor, calls obsessive passion or harmonious passion. In the article, uh, Brooks provides some guidance on the things that are not and are worth giving a shit in your career journey. Uh, he suggests that work, and I would say for pretty much everyone here, I think uh, creative outlets more broadly are like romantic love. Obsessive passion just brings out the worst in us. He goes on to challenge readers to ask themselves, does this work make me a happier, better person? Or in pursuing it, am I neglecting other important things that life has to offer? Insecurities are like canaries in the coal mine for creative minds, I think. It's important to understand when they're harmonious, a warning sign for a hole in our work or our story, or if they're obsessive, needless comparison to someone else about which you should definitely stop giving a shit. <laughs> so, uh, see insecurities come and go like bikes flowing down the street. You can always find a clear path through if you're patient enough and if you're paying attention. And by doing a daily insecurity check like the one we did earlier, you can learn to avoid some common insecurity triggers or build in coping mechanisms. So identify the insecurity and then hit pause before letting it consume your creative process or stop you from moving forward with something new and interesting. And after you've mastered step one, stop giving a shit, move on to step two, start giving the right amount of shits. So this is about rediscovering your creative perspective every single day um, and figuring out who the people are who will support you in doing that. By now we know that social media can lead to a heightened sense of insecurity. And uh, a few months back, I was reading an article that really spoke to this. It is about how social media can shape our identity. And in it, the author suggests that the constant cataloging of our lives, and I think for us in the creative community, our work may be causing us uh, to lose our ability to remake ourselves. And she reflects on a time when we're permitted to take risks without fear of consequence. And I believe returning to a time like that is probably not possible. We have to share our work. We have to put it out there. Uh, but find a community like the one Nicole mentioned earlier uh, that permits you to take risks, that permits you to continuously reinvent yourself, and that is willing to give you the space, time, and energy, i.e. a community of other creatives who give the right amount of shits. Um, I talk to so many people in the commercial creative industry that act like they have it all figured out, but that mentality really just takes away your curiosity. And if you're not curious, you miss the magic moments that can inspire you to tell a new kind of story develop a new design perspective or discover the next millennial pink. So once you've mastered step one, stop giving a shit or acknowledging your insecurity. And step two, start giving the right amount of shits or figuring out how to channel that insecurity into curiosity, then what do you do? Well, I'm really sorry to say this, but uh, step three is repeat. Nobody who creates anything worth a damn is completely confident in their work 100% of the time. And insecurity only becomes ugly when we cover it up and act like it's not there. And when I first moved here, I was talking to a good friend and mentor of mine, Bill Bunkers, about some of the insecurities that I was feeling. Um, and as Stephanie mentioned earlier, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to have compassionate leaders in your life for moments like this. Something he said, something Bill said really struck me, really stuck with me through the last few weeks. He encouraged me to understand that I'm working on so many different aspects of myself simultaneously. And every area is equally important to who I wanna be and where I wanna go creatively. As your insecurities manifest again and again, don't beat yourself up. Instead, remember insecurities, twin sisters, is hope. Hope that you're gonna fit in, that people will like your, your music or your work hope that your idea will make the world a better place and great news, everyone's insecure right now. So in that, I have no doubt that many of us will find hope and inspiration and new creative outlets. But lastly, before I turn us over to the q and A, I I wanna remind you guys something you may have heard already, but uh, not every moment of insecurity needs to be capitalized on. If you don't come out of this strange time with a new hustle or earth shattering creative perspective or some brand vision for the future, uh, that's okay too. There'll be plenty of more insecure moments for you to master around the corner. Thanks.
Yeah, I really struggle with this as well. And certainly I've been through the the feelings that the speakers earlier, Stephanie and Nicole expressed, you know, kind of self doubt. Am I supposed to be here? Um, you know, it's important to acknowledge when those feelings are happening, they might be pointing to a skill set that you need. Maybe you're feeling that way before a big presentation and you really should be like, maybe they're pointing out that you might need more preparation or feedback. But they can also mean that you're in a really toxic environment. And that's the importance of step two. Like, are you in a place where people around you can support you in that growth and see it as part of your creative process? Or are you in a place that really where they don't have their insecurities mastered? And perhaps that's coming out as well and forcing you to internalize some of that insecurity in the culture. Yeah, I would say uh, I've been a big fan lately of that how to build a life column from the Atlantic. Uh, it explore every topic from career to, you know, how we deal with, um, you know, what different, different really interesting aspects of our life, especially change, uh, which is something that I think was bringing out a lot of insecurity in me. So I can't recommend that enough. Um, it's been very helpful for me dealing with the feelings that I've been feeling lately.